I tell you, I praise the Lord for the people who've trusted Christ. I praise the Lord for the people who have followed the Lord in believers' baptism. I praise the Lord for the people who are going through discipleship on a regular basis, growing in the things of God. Because really, that's what it's all about. Salvation is the greatest thing in the entire universe that, that a sinner like me could be saved. But I tell you... The great thing is that salvation is just the beginning. That moment when we get saved, we get rooted in Christ, and God has designed us then that we might, as we continue to grow in our roots, rise by His grace. Rooted to rise, it is our theme. And what it means is that, church, we are grounded, rooted, or secure in the truth. Our job, according to the Bible, is to make sure that we are rooted. God's job, according to the Bible, is to make sure that we rise and bear fruit. It's called the fruit of the church, anybody? Fruit of the Spirit, not fruit of the well-intentioned Christian, not the fruit of the try-hard, but the fruit of the Spirit. So we get rooted, and God, by His Spirit, makes sure that we rise. And really, when we get rooted... When we get grounded in what we believe, it simplifies life for us. Because what we believe ought to determine how we behave. What we believe ought to determine what, how we behave. So last week we began to dive into understanding the great salvation that God offers us by understanding the greatness, the seriousness of the sin that we have committed. Only by seeing the seriousness of our sin can we begin to understand or appreciate the greatness of our salvation. You know, the greatest need that man has is not for education. And I believe in education. I've been through a lot of it in my life. At this point in my life, I, I have the joyful opportunity to give it back. So I'm not on the receiving end anymore. I get to give it back. And it's a glorious thing because it's better to give a quiz than take it. And all God's people said, amen. amen, amen. But our greatest need is humanity is not education. If that were the case, God would have sent a teacher. Our greatest need is humanity is not financial. Or God would have sent a bank banker or an economist. Sorry, Frank. Man's greatest need is not peace. Or God would have sent a diplomat. But in fact, man's greatest need is salvation. And so God sent us a Savior. Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 in verse number 10, For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which is lost. But if we're not careful this morning, here's what happens. We know that to be the truth. And a number of us even gave a hearty amen. But the reality is that the truth that mankind's greatest need is a Savior, that mankind's greatest need is forgiveness, that mankind's greatest need is to have a right relationship with God, the fact of that will absolutely fall flat. You know, some of us, as soon as I started talking about it, you said in your head and in your heart, well, I've heard that before. Because it's flat. It's old, it's stale, it's out of vogue. This, this idea of salvation or being saved. But if salvation has grown flat to the church, let me ask you, why in the world would this world want what we don't? appreciate why in the world would this world want what no longer moves us you see it may sound old hat and it may sound like something that we've heard over and over and over and over again but the reality is that when it comes to the end of the day there are two options there are only two stations in which we will fall in this life. You know, someone once noted about the Titanic that people sailed with a variety of different 
let's just say they sail with a variety of different classes of luxury. Some sailed very nice, some sailed very poor, some sailed in the middle, some had it all. But at the end of the day, when the final report came back to New York about the Titanic, the people were divided in but two classes, saved and lost. And there are a lot of people in this world, even people who go to churches, good churches like this one, that seem to have it all and seem to have life by the tail. And we are strutting our way through this life. And if we're not careful, we will strut our way right into a devil's hell. There is coming a day when the only thing that will matter is not your level of education, is not your financial stability, is not how well did you do family while you were here, not how well did you raise your kids, but whether or not you are saved or lost. And so this morning, I hope that we can dive right into what it means to be saved by grace. Notice with me, if you would, Roman numeral one. The sin problem. The sin problem. Paul starts out in the first several verses of this chapter, and he says this, And you have he quickened, he, speaking of God, who were dead in trespasses and sins, wherein in time past you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air and the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience among whom also we all had our conversation in times past, in the lust of the flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. If we're going to understand what it means to be saved, what it means to have salvation, then really a fundamental question that we have to address is this, what do I need to be saved from? You know, why do I need to be saved? What do I need to be saved from? And so I want you to notice that Paul starts by laying out the sin problem. And he points out man's condition. He points out our depravity. Our depravity. You know, when you have something wrong with you, you want a clear diagnosis, don't you? I'm going to tell you, the worst thing in the world is to know that something is wrong and not be able to figure out what it is. The worst thing in the world is to have something be wrong and have the doctor run test after test after test and say, well, this is what we think. This is what it could be. This is what it might be. I'm going to tell you, when you've got something wrong, you want a clear diagnosis. Amen? And so when it comes to the problem of humanity and our greatest need, we have to look to the only one who can rightfully diagnose our problem, and that is God Almighty. God is the one who gives the diagnosis, none other. And God diagnoses this. God teaches us, and the Bible teaches us, that man is by nature fallen and depraved. The end of verse number 3 of chapter 2 said this, And we're by nature children of wrath, even as others. It's built into the very fabric of our nature. And really, it goes all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve. When Adam chose to take of the fruit, when Adam chose to disobey God, the Bible says that sin passed upon all men. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12. Notice this with me. The Bible says, well, Wherefore as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. You know, the reason this morning that there is death in this world, the reason this morning that there is sickness in this world, the reason this morning that there are tears and heartache in this world, that there are thorns and thistles, the reason we had to get out, well, I say we like I should take any credit. My poor wife and kids went out yesterday and pulled weeds, is because there is sin in this world, and that sin is because Adam, as representative of mankind, chose to disobey God, and so that sin passed upon 
all men. We are by nature children of wrath. We sin because we are sinners. Why does the dog bark? Why does the dog lick? Why does the dog run around and jump on people who they know have allergies? Because they're dogs. Dogs act like dogs because they're dogs. No surprise. Why do sinners sin? Why is it that we struggle? Why is it that we struggle with the truth? Why is it that we struggle with our thought life? Why is it that we struggle with, with walking with God on a regular basis, reading His Word, drawing closer to Him day by day? Why is it that we struggle to forgive? Why is it that we struggle to obey, to submit under authority, both human and heavenly? Why is it that we sin? It's because we're sinners and are by nature children of wrath. Beyond that, Paul said in verse number one that we were dead in trespasses in sin. In Romans chapter five and verse number six, he said that we are without strength. In other words, our in our depravity, we are helpless to help ourselves. Romans chapter 3, beginning in verse number 10, describes it this way. For as it is written, there is none righteous. No, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good. No, not one. And why do we start here? Why does Paul start by laying out the sin problem? Because the reality of being saved by grace is this. You cannot know God's salvation until you have known your sin. Because salvation is not the reward for the righteous, but a gift for the guilty. And until you see yourself as guilty before God, you can never have access to the gift that He has given because that gift is only for the guilty. That gift is only for the dead. That gift is only for those that are without strength. That gift is only for those who are recognizing that their nature is of the children of wrath. Salvation is not a reward for the righteous. It is a gift for the guilty. And I'm going to tell you, most people have the wrong idea about salvation. You go out into Clyde, Fremont, Bellevue, you take your pick, you knock on doors, and you ask people, hey, we just want to know, are you going to heaven? Most people would say something along the lines of, I think so, I hope so, or yeah, why not? Let me ask you, are most people going to heaven? No. Not according to God's word. Most people are not. You see... Those people that you asked, are you going to heaven? And they would say, yes, I hope so, I think so. Probably, I suppose, maybe. You ask them why, and you'll get a varying degree of answers. Things like, well, because, uh, because I go to church. Or because I, I, I prayed. Or because I got baptized. Or because I went through confirmation. Or because I, I really try hard to do pretty good. You see, we have the wrong idea about salvation. It is not a reward for the righteous. It's a gift for the guilty. And the reality of our depravity is this. Our depravity determines our destiny. Our destiny. You see, Romans chapter 6 and verse number 23 tells us this. For the wages of sin is death. That the destiny of the depraved is death and hell. Is the wrath of God for all eternity. That's the destiny of the sinner. And I think sometimes that many people end up going to hell not because they're a drunk or not because they're a thief but because they never were. And they think that they are too good to be under God's wrath. 
It's kind of like the children of Israel in Romans chapter 10. Paul said of them in verses 2 and 3. For I bear record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. But ladies and gentlemen, it doesn't matter how much righteousness you amass to yourself. The Bible says that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags and the only thing that makes us right in the sight of God is His righteousness. And I'm going to tell you, it doesn't matter how well you travel. If you do it in the wrong direction, it's a bad deal. I can remember when we were in college. I think I was a, a boy. I have been out of college about 10 years now. I'm getting old. I don't know what happened. But it was probably my junior year of college, and we were getting out for the summer. And a bunch of us guys, before we left the next day, we wanted to go out to eat. And so we got in the car, and we had a good car. We had good friends. We had good weather. We had good, good time together. And you know what? We jumped on the interstate and just drove the wrong way. There's no excuse. We were college guys. You know what we realized when we hit the state of Mississippi? <laughs> we realized it didn't really matter how much fun we were having. Because if we were having it in the wrong direction, it was no good. And there are a number of people who go to good churches who will strut their way right into hell. Not because they were a thief, not because they were a drunkard, not because they were an adulterer or a philanderer, but because they never were. And they wrongly assume that by going about to establish their own righteousness, that that would be good enough. You see, our sin... And our sin nature that leads us to sin naturally is a barrier between us and a holy God. God cannot abide. God cannot look upon sin. And every one of us have that sin nature. Every one of us do. And if you don't think that's right, I challenge you, take one marshmallow down to the twos and threes class, toss it in the open door, and step back and watch. You will find if you watch that nursery even, there are kids that can't walk, that can't write, they can't talk. But buddy, they can bite and they can fight because they have already learned that I want what I want when I want it. The sin problem. The sin problem. But aren't you glad Paul doesn't leave us with the sin problem? Aren't you glad that God didn't leave us with just the sin problem? Look at verse number 4. Paul writes this. He says, but God who is rich in mercy. But God who is rich in mercy. For His great love wherewith He loved us even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together and made us sit in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come He might show the exceeding richness of His grace in His kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. Because you see, to the sin problem, God gave the Savior's provision. To the sin problem, God gave the Savior's provision. You know, I have a major problem. This morning, if you can agree to that, that I have a major problem, and that problem is called sin, you are on the right track. Well, what is the answer? What is the solution? What is the provision for that problem? We notice first in this passage, God gave His love. Have you ever stopped to really try to wrap your heart and wrap your mind around the love of God? No, I mean really, have we ever, how long have we really stopped to think about, to meditate, 
to ruminate on the love of God. The love of God that, that exceeds our understanding. The love of God, which according to Jeremiah 31 in verse number 3, is an everlasting love. You see, we aren't sick in sin. We are dead in sin. And yet God looked into our mess. God looked into our filth. And He didn't just pity us. He loved us. You know, there's a difference. I pity those poor dogs that I see on that commercial. But I don't love them. I don't pity the cats. He didn't just pity us. He loved us. He didn't shrink back from who we were. Love met us where we were. You think of the astonishing depths to which He was willing to go to reach us. 1 John chapter 4 and verse number 9 teaches us this. And this was manifest to the love of God towards us because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world that we might live through Him. And the Bible teaches us that His love paid the price for our sin on the cross of Calvary. John chapter 15 and verse 13, Jesus said this, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. And the Bible teaches that the love of God was made manifest when God sent His Son and Jesus lived and Jesus died. We have nice, neat crosses in our churches and they look so fine and distinguished, but that cross that day was not fine and distinguished. It was rough and it was rugged. And it was a real cross on a real hill where a real God-man, Jesus, was nailed. Hear the sounds as they struck those nails through His hands and through His feet. And it was real blood that ran down tattered skin and a wooden cross to the sin-sick earth. Tell you, you pause long and think about a real cross where a real Jesus shed real blood to really end the reign of sin over us. And you become overwhelmed by the mercy and grace of God forever written in red for us by His love. The Savior's provision was His love. The Savior's provision was His life. You see, the Bible teaches us that, that Jesus Christ came down to us. The incarnation. You know, none of us have to take a pilgrimage to heaven. None of us have to find a way to travel to heaven and to ask God to come and save us, to do something for us. The Bible says that Jesus Christ came down to us in the incarnation. The Bible also teaches that Jesus rose again for us. None of us have to travel into the grave. None of us have to travel in to the realm of the dead to try to find Jesus and, and ask Him to, to provide something for us. No, He came down to us and He rose up for us. It was all done by Him. It all comes from Him. The provision for sin is only in Christ. I want you to understand something about His life. The Bible teaches us that He became our sin on the cross that we may become His righteousness at salvation. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5 and verse number 21, For He hath made Him, speaking of Jesus, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. The fancy word is imputation. It means to assign or to credit the account of someone or something. In other words, Jesus Christ took our death. Remember, the wages of sin is death. 
that we might take His life. He took our death that we might take His life. He took our sin that we might receive His salvation. And all of this because of His love. You see, the sin problem was met with the Savior's provision. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. In just a few minutes when we baptize, we're not baptizing to wash away sin. We've got some people who are going to be joining the church. We're not joining the church to join the family of God. Jesus paid it all. I hope every one of us this week seek to love another as He has loved us. To at the very least, love another as we love ourselves. But you know what? We don't, go in, we don't go around practicing the golden rule in order that we might walk on golden streets. Jesus paid it all. He took my sin that I might receive His salvation. The Savior's provision. We've seen the sin problem. We've seen the Savior's provision. Finally this morning, notice with me the simple principle. Verses 8 and 9 tell us this. In fact, can we read this together, church? The Bible says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. You see, we've seen the problem. We've seen the provision. But now the question comes, how do I get the provision to my account? You see, I have a debt and there is a payment available, but that payment does me no good until it's applied to me. Until it's applied to my account. How is it? that I can apply the provision of the Savior to my life. The Bible is very clear. It is by faith alone. It is by faith alone. The Bible says, by grace, are you saved through faith? By grace, grace being that unmerited favor, God giving us what we don't deserve. We don't deserve His provision. We don't deserve His death on the cross. But He gave it to us anyways because He loves us and He desires a relationship with us. By grace are you saved through faith. Faith alone. Now we have to understand what faith is. Faith means conviction of the truth of or belief. In something. Faith means conviction of the truth of or belief in something. Salvation doesn't come by religious rite, by baptism, church membership, or even a prayer. It comes by faith in Jesus. And that idea of faith is being convicted, convinced, believing in Him and what He did on the cross entirely. One of the most simple examples I can give you of what faith is, is simply this. I am fully convinced that this chair will keep me from falling. And so I sit. I have cast myself utterly upon this chair. If this chair fails, then I fall. If this chair doesn't make it, then neither do I. But I have cast myself wholly on this chair. And understand this morning what faith is. Faith isn't a prayer. You see, there are so many, and I think this is where we have, we have kind of really muddied the waters. 
Because we have people who struggle with salvation and we talk about the, the prayer and the, the sinner's prayer and people will say, yeah, I did that. Well, as soon as you did it, are we talking about faith anymore? We're talking about you looking back and whether or not you think you have confidence in the words or sincerity in which you did that prayer. You see, I think we have, we have muddied the waters a little bit and there's a lot of people who struggle with assurance. And if the best we can do is look back and say, I did that, then ladies and gentlemen... That does not speak the way God speaks. It is by faith. You think of the thief on the cross. You think of the thief on the cross. You know, there was one thief that mocked and railed, but another who turned and repented. And let me ask you, what assurance did that thief have that he would awake in paradise with Jesus, as Jesus said. What assurance did the thief have? Was he able to come down and get baptized? Did he ever join a church? Did he ever preach a sermon? Did he ever teach a Sunday school class? Did he ever knock on a door? Did he ever give money to, a, to, a, to the church or to a religious or charitable organization? What assurance did the thief have that he would go to heaven? His full assurance, his conviction, his belief, and who that man in the middle was, and in what that man in the middle had said. You see, ladies and gentlemen, this morning, it is by faith alone. Because when I understand my sin problem, my sin problem that has no other ending than that I fall and fail. When I understand the greatness of God's provision, by faith I am moved to do nothing short of wholesale cast myself by faith. Believing in Jesus Christ and what Jesus Christ has done for me. It is is by faith. It is faith that the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, died, was buried, and rose again to pay for my wicked sin. And the Bible teaches that it is the heart of faith that saves the soul. Romans chapter 10 verses 9 and 10 teach us this. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness. And with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. It is Jesus, plus nothing, minus nothing. One of my favorite accounts in all of Scripture is that of the Philippian jailer in Acts chapter 16. If you know the story, Paul and Silas are locked up, and, uh, and they begin to uh, moan and groan and whine and complain like, like good Christians, right? Wrong. What do they begin to do? They begin to sing. And they sing, and the Bible says there's an earthquake, and, and, and the doors open, and the shackles fall off. And then the jailer realizes what has happened, and he's ready to kill himself. If these prisoners escape, he's going to suffer a fate worse than death anyways before they kill him. So he's ready to end it all. And Paul steps forward and says, don't do yourself any harm. We're all here. And this Philippian jailer brought to his knees says this, and he brought them out and said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And Paul says, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, 
and thy house. The simple principle is this. It is faith alone. It is faith alone. It is faith alone. And you know why it's by faith alone? To put the focus above. Paul says, not of works, lest any man should boast. Hey, there is no one so good this morning who can produce his own salvation. And there is no one so bad that they cannot be saved. If I can't boast of salvation, and Robert Reinberger can't boast of salvation, and Mrs. Hansen can't boast of salvation, if none of us can boast of salvation, well then let me ask, who is it that can? God. And God alone. One chapter earlier in Ephesians chapter 1, Paul says this, three times, beginning in verse 6, to the praise of His glory, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. Why did He make us accepted in the Beloved? To the praise of His glory. Look at verse number 12, that we should be to the praise of His glory who first trusted in Christ. Look at verse number 14, which is the earnest of our inheritance unto the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of His glory. Glory. It is by faith alone so that the focus will be above. You know, there's no one that's going to go to heaven that say, God saved me because. Because I prayed. Because I was a preacher. Because I was anything. Every one of us, from Adam to the last one to get saved in Revelation, are all going to say the same thing. God saved me by His grace and for His glory. By His grace and for His glory. By His grace and for His glory. And what a wonderful truth that salvation, it brings us eternal life, but it also creates an avenue where we might point others to our glorious God in everyday life. Saved by grace. Let me ask you this morning, are you saved by grace? If you were to die today, as unlikely as that may be, where would you spend eternity? Are you sure? Are you sure? You know, I heard a story once of two men who were talking, and a young lady passed by. And one of the men said, Boy, I loved that girl. I loved that girl. You wouldn't believe we, we dated and I doted on her and I bought her gifts. And I, I, I tell you what, man, I, I loved that girl. And I would have married that girl too if it wasn't for something she said. And the other guy said, well, what in the world did she say? And the first guy said, well, she said no. <laughs> and I think about how sad is it going to be though when you stand before God on that day and Jesus has to say, I loved you. You don't know how much I loved you. I died for you. I drew you. I longed for a relationship with you. For Jesus to have said, I would have saved you. But you said no. This morning, if you don't understand anything else, understand this. Salvation is not a denominational thing. It's not a church thing. It's not a hope so thing. It's not a fake it till you make it thing. It is a clear Bible thing. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. The work has been done, and all that remains 
is your response. This morning, are you saved? Are you saved by grace? Could we stand together this morning with our heads bowed and our eyes closed? And this